Oh, of course the clock, it must be 8 o'clock, the train's coming. <laughs> trains don't, don't run. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Shawnee County Board of County Commissioners. It's October 29th, 2020. On my left is Commissioner Aaron Mays, who represents District 3, and on my right is Commissioner Kevin Cook, who represents District 2. I'm Bill Rippon, and I represent District 1. Um, under proclamations and presentations, I'd like to make a motion to add uh, a very short presentation from uh, uh, our election office. So that would be then I two, I or one I I one. All right. Well, yeah. Let's make it I. One, let's make it I one. He needs to get one, back. One two. Yeah. One and then change that one to two. Okay. Second. Okay. Hold it. Are we putting it after the presentation with the long term care or before? Before. 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 Oh, okay. No. So that will be one. Long term care will be two. Okay. There we go. All right. Uh, okay. Motion's been made by uh, Commissioner Ripon, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor, say aye. Those opposed. Motion carries three to zero. Okay, first item. Item one, proclamations, presentations, uh, presentation by election commissioner, Andrew Howell. Good morning, commissioners. Andrew Howell, Shawnee County Election Office. Um, just wanted to give you a real quick update and I apologize for jumping in front, but we've got a lot of voters coming through, so I wanna get back over there. Um, just a couple of quick reminders before I go into the stats of where we're at. Um, you know, we are open today and uh, Friday from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. for po people who would like to vote. We are not open on we are not open on Saturday. So I kind of want to remind people that it's today and tomorrow, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. We've tried to do those extended hours till 7 p.m. for people who want to come in the office uh, at 3420 Southwest Van Buren to vote. Your only time beyond that to do an early voting experience would be Monday from 8 a.m. till noon, and that is usually a, a fair warning, that's usually a long line. So if you get a chance today or tomorrow and you want an early vote, uh, stop by the office to do that. I wanted to just, t just briefly update you on, you know, we've changed up some things as to how we uh, help people get their ballots back, so I wanted to go over some of those stats with you briefly. Um, our early vote traffic in the office has been very high every day, been very high numbers. Um, in fact, yesterday was within 10, I think 10 voters of being all uh, just as high as the very first day. So we're seeing very high numbers. 14,299 voters have voted early in the office since it started um, a little over a week ago. Uh, and our total mail ballots uh, that we have sent out is currently 26,885. We've received 74% of those back at 20,012. Um, through the mail, we received 10,118. Uh, in the office, people dropping them inside the office, 2,842. Ballots received uh, at our drop point across from the election office is 5,976. And at the various locations across town, uh, 1,076. So I think, I think we're seeing big numbers. People really seem to appreciate the extra effort that we've put into making it easy and safer for people to drop their ballots off. So happy to answer any questions, but I kind of wanted to update you on just the large numbers that we're seeing pretty much everywhere. And uh, just a reminder, like I said, on uh, voting today, tomorrow, which is Thursday and Friday, till 7 p.m. in the office, and then Monday from 8 to noon. For those that wonder why it closes at noon on Monday, the reason we close at noon on Monday is so that we can finish preparing the poll books uh, and updating the numbers of people who have already voted in those poll books and get those ready for handout to the election judges who will then need them for Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. So it takes several hours in that process of handing out those poll books and all the equipment and getting everybody ready on Monday it takes us till about 7.30 or 8 p.m. So. That's part of, uh, part of why voting ends by law at noon on Monday, as far as the early voting portion. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Mr. Chairman. Question. 
Andrew, I'm trying to do math here quickly, which is dangerous, but I think I remember you telling us that we had 116,400 voters that had registered to vote for this cycle. Is that correct? I think it was, I think it was 116, 4, 116,415, yes. Well, 415, yep. okay. And if my doing my math, you said we've had 14,299 people come through the office and you've received back 20,012 mail ballots, which takes us up to 34,311, which is right at 29.476%, rounding up to 30% have voted as of the close of business on Wednesday. And so up from our 21% as of Monday. So right. that's yeah. a pretty big jump, even from the, what we've seen then in three days. Yeah, absolutely. We're, uh, like I said, we're continuing to get people dropping those ballots. It's been very steady traffic at, at uh, a lot of our locations. The mail's pretty big every day, so it's probably a good thing that we've had the different options for people to drop and to stop and, and, uh, and to get those ballots to us. But yeah, it's been, it's been a, lot of late, a lot of late nights and a lot of work going on, but we're seeing, I think, significant numbers of people actually ha having already voted. So hopefully you... that'll take a little bit of pressure off on Election Day. But I'm hearing people estimate as high as 90% in some parts of the state, so it may actually just look very much like what we're used to, even despite you know seeing record numbers internally. Do you know what the record is for voter turnout for Shawnee County as a history? I, I know that back 15 to 20 years ago, there were some pretty high numbers, so I'd have to dust those off a little bit. Um, I believe back in the 80s and early 90s, there were some pretty good numbers, so I'll, I'll dig through that and see if I can get that well, let's stay focused on the election. We can look at statistics later. But, you know, I think that it's important to note that we do have some high voter turnouts, and thank you for your office. Again, I'm having nothing but good words about the efficiency of the office, the effect, I mean, just how quickly it's moving, how friendly and courteous and it is. And so I want to thank you and your staff for everything they've been doing. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. I know there's a lot of late hours there, <laughs> so we appreciate it. Andrew, I, I have a quick question about the drop boxes. Um, have they made the process easier for your staff and um, than, than what it would be if we were to get the mail every day for those ballots? I know there's, the volume is up, but I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is it, are the drop boxes going to be a permanent fixture for the voting office, something you use for years to come? Yeah, I, I don't really know yet. I've kind of been holding off to try to figure that out. Um, it does take extra staff to kind of staff those and set them up uh, and, to, and to make sure they're around. Um, there, there will be a certain amount of additional budgeting cost that's not currently in our next year's budget. So we'd have to visit about that. Um, so we do have some federal funds that we can use to currently to fund that piece of it. Uh, it's a possibility. I just I don't know that we've we're kind of busy trying to hang on day by day at the moment. Haven't really thought too far ahead, but it's but it's possible. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All Thank right. you. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next. Um, under proc under number item number one, proclamations presentations, Shawnee County Long Term Care Facility Update. Morning, Commissioners. Derek Fleurlog, Infectious Disease Division Manager, long title from the Health Department. Here to give you um, an overview or an update on our uh, long-term care situation here in Shawnee County. Uh, just a little background on me. Uh, my previous job, I was the director uh, or a director at a nursing home here in town. So I think I have a unique background, um, understanding of both the financial side um, and the clinical side of, of care. Uh, so we'll get going. Um, just to give you a brief background on our facilities here in town, of approximately 20, uh, it's probably actually higher, and depending on what you consider that fits into the long-term care uh, category, because there's group homes and things like that that we are also uh, communicating with as well. So, but quite a few uh, for the Topeka community, and it does encompass many different settings, like I stated. Uh, the important thing to remember about these is that they are regulated by CMS and KDADS, which is the state agency. So those are uh, who does their infection surveys um, and, you know, can take action if, if need be. Most of the facilities uh, are referred to as skilled nursing facilities or SNFs. Um, they offer physical therapy, occupational speech, other services as well. And, you know, when we think about nursing homes, especially historically, they've changed a lot over the last 
well, I don't know how many years. Uh, I'm not that old, so. <laughs> uh, but they have changed quite a bit. So um, I think, you know, what we think is a nursing home probably isn't true in the modern world. Many patients, in fact, go from the hospitals, rehab, get stronger, and go back to where they, they were living. Um, now, some of the long-term care facilities do have assisted living and independent living on their property, their campuses, and so some patients stay on there. It's called aging in place. Um, some of the different aspects I just wanted to mention real quick is some of the reimbursement measures. They are reimbursed mostly by Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, there are some uh, private insurances and managed care that do the same. It is a step down from the hospital, so when I mentioned they go from the hospital to these facilities to rehab um, or, or to live. And there's also a high var variability among the facilities as well. So uh, again, some of them only have that therapy aspect and long-term care, some have assisted living, so on and so forth. The, the, also the important thing to mention is it's pretty darn competitive industry. So facilities, when there's a patient from a hospital, many different facilities will get a referral and they will have a liaison go out and visit the patient and essentially try to sell them on why they're the right place for their care uh, or for them to stay long term. Uh, and they can be for profit or non profit. Some of the changes to the operations that we've seen over the last several months, um, and I was a part of many of these, so it, it's been very interesting to kind of watch the uh, evolution of, of the industry, um, you know, since March, really. There's been suspension of a lot of certain rules and a very uh, focused. Uh, there's been a big focus on infection prevention and control and for good reason. Uh, they've also limited a lot of visitation requirements um, while still having to consider resident rules. So residents have a lot more rights than I think people realize, um, but some of those have been limited by CMS and by KDADS. On August 26th, uh, pretty recent, CMS issued mandated testing requirements. They are now using the county positivity as reference. The CMS document has a link, and this is linked to the KDHE statistics. Um, KDADS also sent them a mandate with a link that they click on to use to find their county positivity. And the important thing to notice um, is that at minimum, they're required to test once a month. That's if you're below 5%. If you're in between 5 to 10 once a week and above 10% twice a week, this is a pretty hefty financial burden on the facilities. Uh, they have all, for the most part, been sent what's called point of care testing or antigen machines. Uh, however, I believe they're still required to pay for um, basically what's referred to as the kits to do the testing. Um, and, and KDHE can get involved in helping with the testing as well. So, question? Yeah, the testing, is that just of, uh, of the residents or is that for staff and yeah, is so that all, everyone? All staff. This is uh, staff here. So, okay. uh, and that's where it's probably most important because as I'll kind of speak to here just real quickly, that's where we see the spread occur. Um, that's where most of the, the uh, clusters and outbreaks begin. So uh, that's who they'll, they'll test. So since March, I uh, went back and looked, we've had approximately 25 COVID-19 clusters in Shawnee County long-term care facilities. And uh, one of these was 125 plus cases. So, and this includes staff and residents together. Uh, currently, we're monitoring 10 facilities. Eight are in active testing that's being supported by KDHE. Um, the other two, we are working to get um, some negative testing rounds, and hopefully that'll kind of clear them. So our case increases in Shawnee County. Why? Staff often bring it in. They often work at more than one facility, and they have to make in, ends meet as well. Um, but really, the main thing is that once one case pops up, it's incredibly difficult to stop it or slow it down. Uh, and we often see an exponential increase in cases. So two becomes four, four becomes 16, so on and so forth. And the, the, the important thing to remember as well is that the, uh, the demographic of the, the work environment or the staff, like I said, it requires them to work at one or more facility. Um, and so we've been working with the facilities. A lot of them have noticed staff or have discussed with their staff about being open and transparent in terms of working at multiple places. And we've been able to kind of help mediate that as well. 
These are our long-term care deaths by week. This is as of 1026, um, and this starts way on the left there in March. So we've seen quite an increase as, we, as we've gone on here into August and September. Um, we've worked really hard, our division has, to communicate back and forth with the long-term care facilities to report any uh, deaths that they, that they may have had. And we've had, we have really good relationships, relationships built with the facilities and their administrators and staff. What's interesting is that is if you compare this with our confirmed cases by date of diagnosis, you'll see that it pretty much follows our rise in cases in the community. And this is because community spread is the biggest indicator of nursing home spread. So we often say that nursing home spread is community spread or vice versa. Um, and you can kind of see the increase as we've gone on to early August. Uh, as far as our cases goes, and then if you shift to the right, you'll see those, uh, the death count creep up to six there in late August, um, stayed pretty consistent, and then we're almost mimicking that late increase here, uh, late September and early October. It's also important to remember that deaths are ov often, excuse me, often a lagging indicator, um, so they take a while to reflect cases, and that makes it really tough. Our percentage of Shawnee County deaths associated with long-term care We've had 82 total, 58 associated with long-term care. That makes for 71%. I do think the numbers add some context to that, but it is a very large percentage. Long-term care cases do represent about 13.7% of our total caseload, and approximately 12% of all of our long-term care cases have passed away, um, and that's pretty darn concerning as well. I mentioned this, our biggest indicator of nursing home spread is community sp spread. I wanted to include a couple quotes, most notably below, and I forgot to add the date, but this is by um, actually former Kansas Governor Mark Parkinson. He's now the head of uh, the AHCA, and uh, they're kind of their, the biggest um, advocate for our long-term care. So he, he mentioned that the number one factor in keeping COVID out of our nursing homes is reducing the level of virus in the surrounding community. So what have we done to kind of help well, first off, uh, we're in constant communication with the facilities. We do have a dedicated liaison. She's actually an APRN. She's an advanced practice nurse, so she's very qualified. She works uh, daily, hour after hour, working with our long-term care facilities. Uh, they are usually reporting positives to her, and we're kind of working back and forth, um, having them keep spreadsheets. We're keeping spreadsheets and, and keeping track of testing as well. Like I mentioned, we work closely with KDHE and KDADS when positives and testing occurs. We even worked with the ombudsman, and she is the representative of the uh, residents in the facilities as well. So we're trying to take any and all action we can that's hurting or helping the residents and the staff alike. We've also been working on cluster management. This is obviously where the biggest amount of our clusters occur. And then we've had weekly and biweekly Zoom meetings with the administrators as well. Again. The timing of this depends. I don't want to overload them. They're very, very busy as it is, um, and, and we're, but we're trying to keep communication open that way as well, and of course open for meetings whenever they request them. Do help with some interpretation of CMS mandates and obviously offering emotional support as well. Um, in special circumstances, we will go on location often with the state to review policies and procedures, and this is done on a, this is a non-regulatory type of review, so there's there's no, you know, off, off, often the concern on their level is fines or things like that, financial burden, and nothing like that comes from us or KDHE. So we just offer reviews, and again, this is special circumstances, so we do go in with full PPE and uh, all, that, all that stuff too. So um, I do think early aggressive intervention really helps in the beginning. Like I said, being a part of a nursing home, I saw it firsthand, I saw the weekly meetings, um, back then it was Missy Middendorf and Marla Wirtz. Marla is now the uh, infectious disease team leader, and so she's been a real asset to that as well. And we've just seen the community sp spread climb, unfortunately, and, and often it's attributed to staff, which is not their fault, and we certainly understand that. So we work hard to make them aware and, and help with testing too. Um, I am in the beginning stages of creating what I'm terming the Shawnee County Long-Term Care Task Force. So this is kind of an advisory council to help mitigate, mitigate spread um, and help with other issues. We'll include you know, some of our staff, long-term care administrators. Uh, we've, I've reached out to KDAD, CMS, and some other notable members of the long-term care industry as well. And we'll see how that, uh, how that helps and when that gets going. 
I did want to include a couple of comments from administrators here in, here in uh, Shawnee County, and I thought these were very powerful. So only as strong as the collective decisions we make, and we must do the very next best right thing. Those really hit me. I actually took a couple you know, seconds and of silence to, to let it uh, sink in. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Mr. Mays. Derek, on the testing that you guys, or that you mentioned, is being done weekly, bi-weekly, um, we've seen tests take a while to come back in, in many cases. Are these tests for long-term care facility folks prioritized over testing of the general public? So the tests that they do on site, actually they have to self-report, which can be a barrier. Um, recently, we've, we've reached out to them. Uh, we can't do it for everybody, but you know, if there's an active cluster situation, often the administration is working on the floor to help residents, and resident care must come first, and so we've offered to report those cases too, because they have to be reported to the state first. Um, they're actually not required to report to the local health department, although we ask that they do, just to keep us on the same page. Um, in terms of if the state does PCR testing, I, I, I don't know that they're prioritized, um, but they do come back quickly within 24 to 48 hours. Um, and Robert Geist from KDHE has been working with them very, very closely on that. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, would you say most of your patients that, that, that do die have comorbidity issues? Um, you know, I'd have to go back and look. I mean, I think over a third of all Americans have comorbidities. Um, you know, diabetes, um, anything can be a comorbidity. Obesity is huge as well. Um, it's pro that's probably a fair statement to make. And obviously, they're older. They're older. Um, most are, you know, usually when we're talking long-term care, it's 60, 65 plus um, Medicare age, I guess you could say. So I think that would be a, a fair statement to make. When we, we know that a lot of their, our transmissions coming from workers. Do we keep track of where, other locations that they work at so we can see if there's hot spots? You know, say they're working in a factory somewhere. Do we watch that? And, and if there's a hot spot, then can we yes. then limit that person's uh, exposure to the people in that nursing home then? Or? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I would say that, that we limit them. Um, you know, one of the interesting things that we've had happen lately here is a lot of high school aged young adults work at long-term care facilities you know their CNAs or things like that so um, and if you know when you're doing routine testing you know we've seen some of that come up and so when they're associated with another facility or another workplace we can alert both um, and obviously within the long-term care community we've been urging them to work together try to be transparent with their employees but as I understand it their employees uh, it's their right, if they wish to exercise that, to not be open about it. So um, I hope that answers your question. No. All right. Mr. Chairman? Yes. What things can the county commission do or give to you to help you do your job better? To be honest, um, you know, just mitigate community spread, and I know that that's very difficult to do. Um, I think everything that I've put up here today is it's kind of jarring when you step back and look at it um, and especially when you look nationwide too I mean we've all heard about the other facilities and um, well here in Kansas and in other states as well especially early on um, I do believe that we're doing a good job I think our st we're very focused on long-term care that's our because obviously as you've seen 71 percent of our our deaths have occurred there um, you know we're, we're doing this we're, we're urging the same things wear your masks wash your hands in terms of uh, long-term care employees. We're, we're working on fit testing employees at all of the uh, facilities. We've had a few requests to that. We've, we have the new port accounts, and so we're working on that as well. Um, and I think just keeping those mitigation strategies um, in place so that we can um, help assist the communities and, and keep their staff healthy so that we can keep their uh, residents healthy as well. As you continue to do your job and work with the facilities, if there are things that you see that would help mitigate um, the spread, please do communicate back with us and communicate yeah. with our team. Um, I think that it's one of those all eyes and all hands on deck. 
Yeah, and I, I will mention that we, we get communication from the governor's office and from KDADS on different mandates that they might have. So CMS has their mandates, and that's kind of the minimal standard. But the state um, is welcome to do, you know, higher mandates or, or, or more powerful mitigation strategies as well. So anytime that comes through my inbox or I'm aware of something, I'm sending it off to our, we have an email group of all of our administrators, and we're in constant communication back and forth with all of that stuff. But I will, I will definitely keep you all uh, in the loop. Uh, one, one last question. Uh, do we have like a four-month plan of what we're going to do and, and how we're going to try to limit? Nothing in place, but I think this task force um, will be good for that. And I've had quite a few uh, administrators and DONs and even KDADS representatives reach out and say, yeah, we would absolutely love to be part of that. And um, I think we could absolutely come up with, with something kind of outlining the future and, and what's ahead. Of course, it'll be kind of hard and difficult to know what the federal government and state governments are going to do in terms of long-term care, but we can certainly come up with something. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next. Item three, consent agenda. Uh, I would move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Ripon, seconded by Commissioner Mays. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries three to zero. Next item. Item four, new business, A County Clerk number one, consider all voucher payments. Commissioners, we have two vouchers this morning. The first, again, is labeled under what we would classify as our normal voucher report. Um, that voucher report uh, totaled, let me get over to it, I'm sorry. The uh, $668,719.51. The primary expenditures out of that report, the Shawnee County Sheriff's Office had $142,566.56. That was for four, four 2020 Dodge Durangos primarily. Additionally, under holding accounts with the state of Kansas, we had $101,268.46. And then under allocations, we had $24,750. And that went to the East Topeka Center or Council on Aging and Harvesters. And I do not have any question regarding that voucher report. Under our CARES Act Relief Fund voucher report, we had $1,174,529.21. That was made up from community-based programs of East Topeka Council on Aging, SENT, Sheltered Living Incorporated, and Topeka Housing Authority, municipalities and cities, which was the city of Topeka, and schools, the Care Paravel, Heritage Christian, Shawnee Heights, and the St. Matthew's Catholic School. And I do not have any questions regarding either voucher report. You said the CARES relief was one million. I, I have 668,000. It, it's, it's, it's actually the opposite. CARES that totals up to 1,174,529 okay. and 20 cents. Our normal voucher report was $668,719.51. Okay. okay. All right. But I would move for approval of those two voucher reports. I'll second. Uh, motion's been made by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Ripon. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries 3-0. Next item. There are no, there are no correction orders today. Uh, item B, Public Works, number one, consider approval uh, to issue a re request for qualifications for the on-call right-of-way app appraisal and acquisition services for various road, sewer, and bridge projects for calendar year 2021, with option of extending the agreement through December 31, 2023. Good morning, Commissioners. Kurt House, Director of Public Works. Uh, our existing contract expires at the end of this year, so I'm before you requesting approval to solicit proposals for calendar year 21, 22, and 23. And as the county clerk said, the final two years would be somewhat optional, provided both parties wish to continue with the contract. Questions? I do not. Questions. I'll move for approval. Second. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Cook, second by Commissioner Ripon. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries 3-0. Next item. 
Item B2, consider authorization and execution of contract C434-2020, change order number one final to contract C106-2020 for the Southeast 69th Street Bridge over tri tributary to Lynn Creek Project with Reese Construction Company, Inc., reflecting an as-bid versus as-construction uh, quantities which result, resulted in a $3,144.46 decrease to the original contract amount of $514,676.61 for a final contract amount of $511,532.15. Kearney House, Director of Public Works. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago today, we had substantial completion on our project, uh, Southeast 69th over Lynn Creek, um, over a tributary to Lynn Creek. And today I'm before you with the final change order. Again, really what it represents is as bid quantities versus as construction quantities. Uh, the unit costs stay the same, uh, and it resulted in the, the reduction that the county clerk uh, talked about. It uh, results in a total project cost, including all design costs, all construction costs, right away utility contingencies well now we have zero contingencies but it results in a total project cost of six hundred fifteen thousand dollars which is fifteen thousand dollars with uh, what we had come before you approximately eighteen months ago so with that take your questions any questions no. i'd move for approval second motion's been made by commissioner ripon seconded by commissioner mays all in favor say aye those opposed Motion carries 3-0. Thank, Thank you, you commissioners. Sir. Next item. Item C, Stormont Vale Events Center number one. Consider approval of RFQ bid submission and the authority to enter into a contract with Park Hub for parking automation and payment systems at the Stormont Vale Events Center in the amount of $28,100 with funding from allocated coronavirus relief funds. Good morning, commissioners. Kellen Seitz, Spectre Venue Management in the Stormont Vale Events Center. Uh, what you have before you today is uh, an additional expansion of our uh, touchless and contactless uh, coronavirus relief funding uh, options that we've went out to bid with. Uh, this piece of infrastructure specifically uh, is for our parking systems. Uh, this would be a parking payment uh, and automation system uh, that would allow for our patrons to fully integrate their, their parking purchase uh, in advance uh, as opposed to paying cash when they arrive, which is what we have traditionally done. Uh, this integrates directly into our ticketing platform, which is Ticketmaster. Uh, so those parking fees can be built directly into a ticket when you purchase a ticket uh, to attend an event at the facility. Uh, for those patrons who do not purchase uh, parking uh, as part of their ticket uh, elective option when they uh, make that transaction. They have the ability to pay for parking uh, on site. This system does allow for a contactless option for those patrons to pay uh, via Apple Pay, uh, any kind of mobile payment system, uh, or direct chip card reader system uh, that the patron never has to hand off to one of our employees and we never have to take that from the patron. They can uh, do that transaction directly from this point of sale. Kellen, how does that work when I arrive at the parking lot, how, how do they know I prepaid? Yeah, so you will get, uh, much like you get a, a normal ticket uh, or a mobile ticket uh, delivered to your inbox, if uh, when you purchase that ticket, you will also get a parking voucher uh, that is uh, a QR code that these readers will scan uh, when you arrive at the parking facility, uh, and then it prints you off a, a receipt voucher, uh, and then we give that to you, you put that on your dash, and you just go find your spot to park. Uh, some of the other uh, pieces that this program offers is the ability to integrate some of the parking areas that we have never uh, done either mobile or web-based before. And those are things like our RV parking systems that allows us for advanced reservations uh, of those parking systems. If we have an event that's uh, strictly based in the parking lot, we can allocate out a certain number of spaces. It allows us to allocate out sponsor parking, uh, you know, higher tiers or lower tiers of parking as well. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty robust system. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Kellen, I would assume that there are some redundancies in place that says that a 
Tim Wrencher can't get a parking pass and email it to 20 of his friends and everybody get in for free. Correct, yeah, the QR code, uh, much like uh, new mobile tickets, uh, changes every time you open uh, that ticket. So uh, it's not a barcode, uh, it is a unique QR code uh, that, that changes every time you open up that application in your, in your mobile device. Better luck next time, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I'll right. move for approval. I will second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Ripon. All in favor, say aye. Those opposed, motion carries 3-0. Thank Thanks, you. Kellen. Next item. Item D, Parks and Recreation, number one, consider approval of request to solicit bids for a project budget totaling approximately $103,225.08 to make repairs and improvements to the irrigation system located at Lake Shawnee Golf Course, utilizing the Golf Course Revolving Fund. Good morning, Commissioners. Chris Curtis, Shawnee County Parks and Recreation. Uh, today we're seeking uh, approval to go out for a bid for a project that would replace the irrigation pumps, all, the, all uh, associated piping and valves, and the installation of variable frequency drives, and the removal and inspection of the existing motors and uh, any uh, required maintenance that we discover up to including the replacing the bearings. Anything beyond that, we'd have to evaluate and see whether we wanted to move forward with that. Um, this would be funded out of the revolving fund, as you know, is um, supported through uh, golf fees. I'd be willing to take any questions now. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Ha is this going to affect any of the play or the ability to use the gorse while this is being done? Well, should the existing pump that's working fail, <laughs> then yes, it would have a direct impact on ability to play. I mean, it would, it, it would impact the quality of the course, which would um, probably drive some golfers away if we couldn't water the greens and fairways. So yes, it would have an impact of, of impacting the ability to play or drive rounds. I, just, I know that uh, the course is still being used, even though we have the uh, pandemic. It's one of the few things that people are able to go out and do is still go play golf if that's something Correct. that you enjoy yeah. doing. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's why uh, this project is, is uh, feasible at this time, because our uh, revenues are up. Um, again, there's no good thing associated with COVID, but as you just said, there are uh, an increase in outdoor activities, and golf is one of those. And so we do have uh, funds in excess of where we were last year to pay for this. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, would this affect the operating expense of the sprinkler system at all? Or be it should have a positive effect. The variable frequency hoping. drive should make the pumps run more efficient, so we should gain some... Uh, uh, decrease in use of, of electricity and power. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll move to approve. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner May, second by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 3 0. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next item. Item D2 consider approval of request to solicit bids for renovations to the Bladesdale Pool locker room roof with an estimated cost of $30,356.50, utilizing 2020 operating funds. Good morning, Commissioners. John Boyd, Parks and Recreation. We are seeking approval to get the roof replaced on the locker room and, and concession stand area of Blaisdell Pool. Uh, it's a membrane unit, been down quite a few years. It's starting to produce a lot of leaks and showing a lot of wear. So we'd like to be able to get that replaced before we open in the spring. Be happy to answer any questions. Is, so this is just the locker room, not the concession area or anything like well, that? Well, yeah, those is buildings. There. Kind of not, the, just the whole thing. Though. Not the rental building and the pump house. That's a metal roof, but this is a membra membrane roof on the flat area of the building. Okay. Yeah, this was uh, this was part of the old Blaisdell pool, this building, and, and I know at the time that was it was 20 years ago when we renovated that and yeah. Uh, so yeah it's probably about time um, any other questions uh, Mr. Chair, just yeah. the timeline for the construction when you anticipate getting started having it completed by uh, we hope to be able to get it done this winter it's always weather dependent but i've had conversations with the roofing contractors in town and and they're saying they're able to work all winter as long as there's not snow cover so by spring. Okay. okay. I'll move for approval. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Ripon, seconded by Commissioner Mays. All in favor say aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 3 0. Next item. Thank you. 
Item D3, consider approval of request to, spread, uh, to award the uh, bid to Ace Electric for the re replacement of a light pole and fixtures at Dornwood Park in the amount of $12,145 with funding from the Capital Maintenance 3R Fund and authorization and execution of contract C436-2020 for same. Good morning, Commissioners. Randy Luby, Parks and Recreation. If you recall, uh, last March we were down here um, you gave us approval to uh, go out for bid for this project. During that time, a severe storm came through and actually blew the pole over. Um, we met with the um, Topeka Baseball and Softball Association, and um, they we came to a decision to go ahead and wait to send out the RFP until the season was over. This field wasn't going to be used. Um, the numbers were down slightly with COVID. So we uh, waited until September to go out. And um, today before you, we'd like to accept uh, East Electric to replace the pole and um, get the job done. Is this one of the light poles or is this yes. just a... Okay. We noticed it was in need of repair, and that's why we came in uh, March, but uh, that storm came through, and luckily it came through at night, and nobody was hurt and didn't cause any damage um, at the time. So, Are we through? Oh. Oh, go ahead. Are we through with play out there at this time? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. And did we pursue any kind of an insurance claim since it was weather related? Um, I don't believe we did. If I recall, and uh, Cindy would know better, but I believe it's a $10,000 deductible. Uh, okay. um, so it wouldn't be a whole lot to do with that. Well, $2,000 is still $2,000. We, we could. Um, I didn't know if, well, the, the pole was damaged to begin with, um, okay. so we were looking to replace it. I, I can sure look into the insurance. Don't, don't say so much, because I listen to these shows. These <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We, we don't. I mean, we will we'll gladly present a, a plan to the to the insurance company. No problem. All right. I'll move for approval, but I would ask that the department look at all possible options, including any insurance policies. I'll second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Ripon. All in favor, say aye. Those opposed. Motion carries. Three zero. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Randy. Next item. Item E, Sheriff's Office, number one. Consider authorization and execution of contract C-437-2020 with priority dispatch for software that allows dispatchers to obtain necessary COVID-19 related information for all responders, including a call script for calls taken in the communications center for a total cost of $325,105 to be paid from CARES Act monies. Good morning, Commissioners. Melanie Berger, Shawnee County Sheriff's Office, Communications Division. Today we're requesting approval to purchase Priority Dispatch utilizing the CARES Act monies. This is a scripted call taking software that um, our dispatchers would ask the questions and it would um, essentially dump into our uh, computer aided dispatch. We would be able to ask COVID related questions and be in line with the CDC guidelines and the Shawnee County Health Department. And as those guidelines change, we would be able to change our questions. Um, that way we can provide information to our responders. Um, that way they're aware should they come in contact with anybody that um, could be uh, COVID. This all, the system also allows for a decrease in response to assist in social distancing for our responders and to assist in mitigating the spread. For example, getting the right people to the right place, uh, maybe not sending so many officers, uh, instead maybe just one, um, same with the fire and the EMS side. Should we lose several staff due to COVID um, sickness or self-isolation, this provides tools for less experienced dispatchers to augment some of the workload and take those calls um, because that script would be right in front of them um, if they haven't completed their training yet. All of the necessary paperwork and contracts have been through the county counselor's office. The cost of this is $325,000, $325,105. It has been approved by the SPARC committee as an eligible purchase with CARES Act, and um, it will be in place and in use by the deadline of December 30th. Are there any questions? Is, is that uh, timeline in there 
in our agreement with them because this is critical that we yes um, okay. we have required that that de that deadline be in um, the contract and um, Jim's office was able to confirm it thank you Jim mr. chairman yes I would thank you Melanie this is the presentation that we saw um, a couple of weeks ago and the I think that it's going to add a lot of robust um, offers and features to our already dispatch. Um, I know that the uh, chief of the Topeka Fire Department is here, and I know that they've spoken in favor of it in the past, and this is something that will help um, fire, ambulance, um, rural fire, Topeka Police Department, and Sheriff's Office, and so really coordinating all the branches. So thank you for bringing this forward. I'll move for approval. I'll second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Ripon. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Thank you, Millie. Thank you. Next item. Item E2, consider authorization and execution of contract C438-2020 with New World for the interface necessary to link priority dispatch as the uh, current New World computer-aided dispatch for a cost of $13,320 to be paid with CARES Act monies. Good morning, Commissioners. Melanie Berger, Shawnee County Sheriff's Office Communications Division. The interface that is necessary to link priority dispatch to our New World computer aided dispatch system um, is $13,320. Um, that is a critical piece in order for all of the questions that we go through on the script to be dumped into the computer aided dispatch. And that is how we, that's the system, which is our means for dispatching all calls for service. It is used also by all of the partners um, that we work with and dispatch for. It also ensures that we would get appropriate alerts on any houses or individuals that have um, any COVID related issues that we do receive from the Shawnee County Health Department. And um, it is critical for the project to work. All those contracts as well have been put through the county counselor's office and the SPARC committee has identified it as a, an eligible cost. Um, and the deadline also would be met by December 30th. It would be in place. Any questions? No, I'll, I'll move to approve. I'll second. Motion's been made by Commissioner May, second by Commissioner Ripon. All in favor say aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 3-0. Next item. Item E3, consider authorization and execution of contract C439-2020 with NICE for the inter uh, interface necessary to link priority dispatch Aqua suite to the current operational system in order to pull up information for open records, open records requests and uh, court subpoenas for a cost of $6,793 to be paid with CARES Act monies. Melanie Berger, Shawnee County Sheriff's Office Communications Division. Our NICE inform recorder is our means of pulling all recordings um, to comply with our statutory obligations for open records um, and retaining any history in a communications center. This is another critical piece for the priority dispatch um, project that the NICE inform recorder be interfaced with the Aqua Suite. Um, this will, number one, allow us to stay in compliance with our statutory obligations to provide those recordings and ensure that all the information that the dispatcher is working through is um, uh, able to be given out. In addition, it also is going to provide us a link to our current quality assurance system so we can provide necessary feedback to our dispatchers. Um, our policy and procedures have changed very rapidly since March and they're constantly looking at new policies and, and complying with new information. So we want to make sure that we're giving them appropriate feedback and um, this allows us to do that as well. Um, it does cost $6,793 and has been approved by the SPARC committee for uh, utilization of CARES Act and all the appropriate contracts have also been through the county counselor's office and um, would be in place by the deadline of December 30th. Any questions? Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, just kind of looking at the last two items, are, are these going to be annual expenses or are these just upfront setup costs? Yes. Um, so that's a good question, Commissioner Mays. There is actually an annual cost on all three of them. Um, those annual costs are going to be paid out of our Sheriff's Office budgeted funds. I apologize, I, I left that out. But yes, there is an annual cost. Um, for priority dispatch, the annual cost is 41280 
Uh, for NICE, the annual cost is $2,300, and New World is $1,223. Okay. And out of curiosity, are we phasing out any other software by adding this? No, we, we would not be. Okay. Any other questions? Move for approval. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Rippon. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries 3-0. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Melanie. Next item. Item F, Health Department number one. Consider approval of request to create and fill one social worker position at a salary of $53,884, including benefits, with funding from the KDHE Epidemiology and Lab Capacity Cooperative Agreement Grant, and to fill any positions that become vacant as a result of filling this position. Good morning, Commissioners. Derek Fleurlog with the Health Department again. Uh, here to ask for your blessing to um, <laughs> create a role within the Infectious Disease Division for a social worker. Uh, this is a grant uh, through KDHE. It is a two-year grant, uh, but we would work to retain the social worker. I think, as we all know, there's been a lot of challenges for families um, in our residents of Shawnee County. Social workers are very, very um, variable in what they can do, and so this would be someone that could uh, reach out to those that are in need, um, different resources, um, as well as working with mental health. I think they would also be a, a, a positive person to work with those that are positive, those that are in quarantine, um, and, and kind of help from the mental health aspect too. Post-COVID, uh, I would see this person working with our uh, SCE clinic, family planning, um, you know, just helping people meet their basic needs. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? So you said, just to reiterate, two years grant funded. Correct. And then after that, who knows? <laughs> yeah, we would work, yeah. <laughs> For lack of a better term, yes, but we would yeah. work to, uh, to retain them. And I will add that, uh, like I said, social workers can do a lot of different things. They're very, very qualified. This is a bachelor's level social worker, so that gives us um, a bigger pool to choose from. And uh, I do personally know quite a few that work at the hospitals and nursing homes, too, so we'll work on that end as well. Okay. Great. Are, are you seeing a, an increase in family, I guess, issues with kids? Yeah, that's something kids? actually I wanted to mention. Uh, we are getting an increase of questions of those. Um, the most notable one is probably people asking for places to stay, housing needs. And so this would be a perfect liaison for that, to reach out for their mental health, help them find a place. I know we're working on some other things concerning that as well. Um, and then we also have families that reach out, obviously, if you're in isolation. Um, we have those that need you know, certain grocery needs or uh, prescriptions that need picked up, that sort of stuff. We could potentially uh, have our social worker work with as well. All right. Any other questions, comments? I'll move for approval. Second. I'll second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Mays. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries 3-0. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Next item. Item G, Administrative Services, number one. <clears throat> Consider approval of resolution number 2020-57, allocating the 2021 social service funds, service programs for the elderly funds, and special alcohol drug uh, program funds. Good morning, Betty Greiner, Director of Administrative Services. This resolution would approve three allocations for 2021. The allocations for social service agencies, for service programs for the elderly, and for special um, alcohol and drug programs. The first one, social service agencies. As you will recall, um, for the 2021 budget, 190,000 was budgeted for this item. Uh, let's, Community Resource Council um, performs a service for Shawnee County for taking, uh, gathering a board. They take the applications for these, they um, gather the board together and that board hears and evaluates the applications and then makes a recommendation to the commission on how to allocate those funds. That uh, total was 190,000. This would allocate that to the ones that are listed. The next one is service programs for the elderly. That uh, budget item was $669,623 that was allocated to this. 
CRC does a similar, uh, performs a similar duty for us on this one. It is a different board that gets together and evaluates these service programs and then they make a recommendation. This is their recommendation that totals the $669,623. Mary Thomas is here from uh, CRC if you have any questions on those programs. Then the last one is special alcohol drug program. This is not a budget item, but this is an item that we received from the state. Uh, the, uh, they have a special council that meets and makes their recommendations. Uh, the last two years, this has been right around $45,000. Now this one we allocate based on a percentage rather than on a dollar amount because it's not a, a budgeted allocation, it's just whatever we receive in from the state. If we do it on a percentage basis, that way everything that comes in can turn around and go out to these organizations uh, based on um, the recommendation of the council. Um, Rochelle Vegas, Ve I'm sorry, let me say this again. Rochelle Vega Ratana is here to answer any questions that you have on this allocation. So, would you like questions, to? Mr. Chairman, do you yes. have any questions? Um, Betty, just I think that just for clarification, it's my understanding that the special alcohol drug programs, there is a tax that is collected on alcohol sales within Shawnee County, and a portion of that tax that's collected goes towards alcohol related programs. Yes, that's correct. And so that's where we would have the funding for PARS. And thank you for the work that they do, as well as the Third Judicial District Drug Court. I see Amanda is here from that. And then also Vallejo with their um, behavioral health care social detox program. And so, um, but just to kind of clarify where that tax is coming from, it is from alcohol sales in Shawnee County. Any question? Wow. I'll move for approval. I'll second. second, but I do want to take a moment and thank uh, the CRC and the boards that they serve and the work that Mary Thomas does with those two different boards, the Social Service Agency and the Program for the Elderly. The boards put a lot of time and effort into reviewing all the applications and uh, Mary Thomas for coordinating the boards and CRC's work, so I second that motion. Okay, thank you very much. A uh, motion's been made by Commissioner Ripon, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. Next item. Item H, County Counselor number one. Consider approval of request to fill a vacant paralegal legal assistant position at a salary of $56,281.04, including benefits with funding from the department budget. Good morning, Commissioners. Jim Crowell, Shawnee County Counselor. I have an open position in my office. If this request is approved, we'll begin advertising and recruiting for the position. At this point in time, I'm not seeking a change in the current duties and responsibilities or the salary range for the position. I'll be happy to answer any additional questions, questions you might have. I'll move, move for approval. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Ripon. Second by Commissioner Mays. All in favor say aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 3-0. Next item. Thank, Thank you. you. Item I, Commission, consider canceling the Monday, November 16th Commission meeting. The Commissioners will be meeting as the Board of Canvassers at the Election Office. I'll, I'll, I'll move, move for approval. Yeah. <laughs> second. Uh, motion made by Commissioner Ripon, second by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 3-0. Next item. Item 5, administrative communications. At this time, anybody can, uh, let's see, we have Dr. Petzino. Good morning, Commissioners. Gianfranco Pizzino, Shawnee County Health Officer. It's with uh, very mixed feelings that based on personal reasons, I have decided to not renew my contract as Shawnee County Health Officer when it expires at the end of 2020. Being part of the incredible group of leaders who have guided Shawnee County through what has been arguably the most difficult public health challenge in modern history has been my highest honor. Shawnee County is lucky to have dedicated skilled workers who I'm certain will continue to work incessantly to protect the health of every resident in Shawnee County as they have done for months quietly, sometimes with little recognition or gratitude. 
I want to thank this board and the community for giving me the opportunity to serve. Together, we will move past this difficult time and emerge stronger than before. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Doctor, I'd just like to take a moment and while I, I hate to see you leave the position, um, I want to take a moment and thank you for the work that you've done, not just during the pandemic, but before it. The work that you did with the Community Health Improvement Plan, uh, addressing the um, death rates of African American children within our community, issues of obesity, mental health, um, inequities in health care, bringing those to the forefront so that we can address those as the Board of Health, and then during the work of the pandemic, put you right in the middle of the crossfires of so many different things, um, the work that you've done in the community, and just taking a moment to thank you for all of your work, and uh, it has not gone unnoticed or unappreciated. Thank you, thank you. Commissioner. Thank you for your work. Yeah, absolutely, I would, I would second those sentiments, uh, I think uh, the work you've done over the years for the Shawnee County, um, I know that it's never been about the job for you, but more about the mission. And, and I really appreciate the hard work that you've done uh, for the betterment of our uh, citizens. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning, Commissioner. Linda Oaks from the Health Department. And I, too, want to publicly thank Dr. Pozzino. It's been a pleasure uh, and an honor to work with him these past few years. I've worked with Dr. Pozzino for a long time. And as you said, Commissioner Cook, we've been working with the community health outcomes and community health rankings and all the work he put into that before the pandemic ever hit. So I just appreciate him so much. It's going to be hard shoes to fill. I also want to announce that we are having another flu clinic this afternoon from 4 to 630 at the J.P. Lewis building, which is at 2600 Southwest East Circle Drive. This is for adults. Um, our main emphasis is on uninsured adults, but we will vaccinate any adult who walks in the door, no charge. So again, 4 to 6.30 tonight, um, masks are required for anyone over the age of two. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Commissioners, good morning. Mary Thomas, Community Resources Council. Thanks for those kind words. We appreciate the partnership and work that we've done with you for many years. And I'm here to announce that in our continuing partnership with 501, we have reached an agreement where they would like us to replicate the program that we have at the Avondale East, former Avondale East Elementary School. We will be opening the Lundgren Elementary School, open to social service programs and charitable organizations with services directly to the public right there in Oakland neighborhood so that we can bring the same sort of services that we have at Highcrest West to helping that neighborhood stabilizing crime and you know, improving health and prosperity in that community. We want to bring that to Oakland as well. So if somebody's got a program they need to grow and we've got the space, come see me. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Mary. Good morning, Commissioners. Lee Welch, Court Administrator, 3rd Judicial District. Um, I wanted to take just a moment to bring to your attention and also to acknowledge the drug treatment court um, that we have within the Shawnee County District Court in the 3rd Judicial District. Um, Jason King, who's an attorney with um, the Public Defender's Office, had nominated um, our drug treatment court to be the recipient of the Liberty Bell Award through the Topeka Bar Association. Um, our treatment court was actually awarded or will be awarded this um, award on Friday, November 6th at noon. Um, due to COVID, it will be held uh, virtually via Zoom. And if you're interested, I can provide you with that Zoom uh, meeting ID. Um, but if you'll if, allow me to read um, just a bit from the American Bar Association on what the Liberty Award is, Liberty Bell Award is. It was established more than 40 years ago to acknowledge outstanding community service. Many groups present it to someone who has promoted better understanding of the rule of law, encouraged greater respect for law and the courts, stimulated a sense of civic responsibility, or contributed to good government in the community. It is often presented to an individual 
attorney or judge or to an entire community organization. Um, our drug treatment court began initially in 2002 and due to some national research, um, was the, the format was changed substantially in 2018. Um, Amanda Wilson is here with me today. She's the coordinator for our drug treatment court and Judge Bill Osman is the judge who oversees that um, program. So again, um, Amanda, do you want to speak to? I'll let Amanda give you some a little more insight into the, the actual operations of the drug treatment court, but I want to um, just bring this to your attention and let you know that um, we have been awarded the Liberty Bell Award by the Topeka Bar Association. I guess just to briefly summarize, uh, the Shawnee County Drug Treatment Court is now a post-conviction pre-sentence program um, for offenders charged with a drug or drug-related felony and are looking at a presumptive prison sentence. The program is a minimum of a year in length and if they successfully complete, we have a big graduation ceremony and everything like that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but they also get the chance to um, avoid that prison sentence um, and we think this has been uh, a population in our community that has been important to work with um, and we truly appreciate the support we receive um, every year from the County Commission. Well, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer Very good. That's a, it's an honor to get this. Uh, uh, get this award and it speaks highly of, uh, of your program and, and your staff so thank you thank, thank you very much yeah. thank you Amanda for everything that you do in the program and the drug court and working with everybody and so congratulations thank you very much you're very flattered and humbled thank you thank you anyone else Commissioner Mays Again, just want to remind everyone that time's running out to do your early voting. Um, just reiterate what Commissioner Howell said earlier, that uh, we've got really two and a half days left. So uh, if, you, if you're planning on voting um, ahead of time, go ahead and do it as soon as possible. I would echo those same sentiments. And uh, um, I would also note that there's an item on Monday's agenda regarding a request by solid waste through the planning department and I know that we've had quite a bit of impact and, and emails regarding that and would encourage the public to attend that meeting so that we can discuss that item and making sure that our media partners reach out and letting the public know this is a public meeting here at the Great Overland Station um, regarding the request by waste management at the Rolling Hills Meadows facility. I have nothing to add. We do not have a need for executive session, so we are adjourned. <laughs>